there are times in which that maybe you have a different maturity level and interest and you can gain a lot more from you know studying with respect to the traditional uh, path of just doing one thing after the other people with a high hrv will maybe use it to brag about their high hrv like if it is some marker of you know how fit you are or anything like that but the reality of things is that it's a very weak link with fitness people love to polarize the conversation you know just the numbers or just how you feel and it's like you know you can use both <laughs> they're not mutually exclusive so if you were to take a data point uh you know once at 2 a.m and once at 4 a.m then the impact of the circadian rhythm would mess up the data looking at the data can be very insightful as long as you maintain a healthy relationship with it like if you cannot do that um then it's it's problematic and sometimes it's just better to not use it start with a plan that's the first thing you don't start with hrv you don't go hard every day until hrv is not good anymore right that's nonsense and the recipe for disaster right start with a good plan you know you have your high intensity days you have your low intensity days and then you make some adjustments based on hrv Welcome to this new episode. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor for the podcast, Moxie Monitor. For those who don't know about the Moxie Monitor yet, it's a NIRS device that measures muscle oxygen saturation and blood volume in real time. It's a non-invasive sensor that is placed on the skin and can be worn during any training or sporting activity. Motocross riders and climbers wear it on their forearms. Hockey players on the ice, swimmers can wear it in the water. I've used it to test rugby players, CrossFit athletes, endurance athletes, and more. The Moxie allows you to individualize work and rest periods, optimize load, reps, and sets, identify training thresholds in real time, and even correct movements based on what the data is showing you. You can also use the Moxie monitor to determine an athlete's energetic limiting factor and their individual training zones. Using this process, you can better target the athlete's limiter with precision in order to improve their programming, training, and in turn, their performance. You can view and collect the data on your Garmin watch, and you can also pair the Moxie with other physiological testing products, such as the VO2 Master, Pinoe, and Cosmet VO2 systems. The Moxie is a tool I've used weekly for over a year now with great success, and I highly recommend it to any coach who's interested in digging a little bit deeper on the physiological side of health, fitness, or performance. You can use the coupon code UPSIDE at checkout for a 5% discount on moxiemonitor.com slash shop. That's U-P-S-I-D-E for a 5% discount. With that said, let's get into the show. Okay, Marco, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. I uh, started looking at your work after I found you on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and you were talking a lot about heart rate variability. It's something that I hadn't really had to... Uh, the time of the interest, uh, honestly, to, to look at up until that point. And, uh, but then I was reading uh, Bruce Rogers' blog and I thought I really need to understand that HRV thing a little bit better. So um, I, read your, I read your monster five-part article on, uh, on Medium. What is it? Resting heart rate and uh, heart rate variability. Is it is the title yeah, or something yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah For, exactly. For anybody who wants a comprehensive review of all those things, go check out Marco's uh, great Medium uh, posts. Uh, and uh, so I thought, yeah, great opportunity to get you on the show and talk a little bit about HRV and all things HRV. But maybe before that, um, why don't you give a little bit of your background for uh, for the audience? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, looking forward to chat more about HRV and try to uh, clarify some of those aspects also for other people listening. Uh, on my end, I have a technical background. Um, I studied computer science and engineering. Um, then I did a PhD in machine learning and data science. Um, so it was always, let's say, technical work and engineering work and you know, data science work, but applied to data collected from the body. So that's what triggered my interest the most. Mm -hmm. um, you know about 10 12 years ago we had maybe the first prototype of wearable sensors and things that you know allowed you to measure the activity of the heart the activity of the brain so collecting that data trying to uh, estimate you know useful parameters for you know daily life from things as simple as calories expended to cardiorespiratory fitness level and then aspects related to stress which is eventually where i spent most of my time um, and yeah I love building tools you know, that people can use to measure these kind of things. And that's how I started also with HRV for training. 
side project uh, slowly growing uh, until it was basically uh, yeah large enough to basically sustain uh, what we're doing so that I don't have to do other things. That's what I do these days uh, together with um, yeah a small team and um, I do a bit of teaching here uh, in Amsterdam and uh, I advise for other companies like Aura um, you know trying to help them doing the same so interpreting physiological data to provide useful insights. Um, I have also a degree in um, human movement sciences which is basically sports science here uh, something that you know working always at the intersection between these fields at a certain point we thought maybe I should also study that a bit deeper uh, instead of you know uh, just pretending I know things so it was good to go back to university uh, yeah. with a lot of you know a lot of younger people uh, it was a fun experience and, uh, and learning the basics a bit better yeah how uh, yeah th- maybe start with this talk about your experience back to university how old were you when you went back to uni Oh, it was very recent. It was two years ago, so 35, uh, yeah. and it was a master's. Uh, so the others were maybe 22 or something. Uh, yeah. But so yeah. how, how was that? Talk about the, you know, because you already had a lot of knowledge um, in, in a, let's say, let's call it a complementary field. Um, so so how, how did that, how did that work out? Was it, was it good? Did you, did you sometimes uh, have to correct any of the the professors uh, to talk about your experience with this? And, and then working with the younger crowd as well, how did that dynamic work out? Yeah, I think it was really good. Um, even when I did my PhD, actually it didn't go right after my master's. I waited, I worked for years and then uh, I did it later. I think there are, you know, there are times in which that maybe you have a different maturity level and interest and you can gain a lot more from, you know, studying with respect to the traditional uh, path of just doing one thing after the other uh, obviously both can work but for me I think it was helpful this way so you know I could reason differently and got plenty of different ideas and eventually I also developed some other tools based on you know some of the things uh, that I learned there uh, it was it was good both the interaction with uh, you know the teaching staff and also the fellow students I think everything was pretty good people at different times and with different um yeah goals and ideas but you know for me i wasn't there to then go and work in a sports environment right for me it was just the learning basically uh, that kind of experience and maybe to a certain extent the network um for them it was very focused on you know trying to get the job in a team for example and things like that but it's for me very interesting was to see that aspect and you know the practical side also of people using the tools that we make right we make devices to you know sensors and apps to measure physiology um, to track in particular responses to training right even though you know everything is stress and we'll talk about that later but uh, you know the main application still is exercise and sports so we work with so many teams um, and it's good I think to see firsthand also the way they operate the way um, you know they use these things or what they know what they don't know uh, what is painful for them when they use these kind of things you know the process Mm -hmm. so I think all of that adds to you know what we can do to try to make it easier would you say that going in going back uh, into uni with let's say already a a job on the side or already a lot of experience in the um I was going to say the real world, but that's not, that's not exactly what it is. It's just as a, you know, professionally, you've, you've, you already had um, a lot of experience. Did you feel maybe less pressure than the young uh, students that were there that, like you said, maybe needed a job when they, when they got out, did you feel less pressure or did you feel that that affected either positively or negatively your, your learning at all? Yeah, it's different for sure. Um, Yeah. I think uh, on one end I had to do that while, running a business and everything else so it was a bit stressful despite the different type of stress uh, Uh being there but uh, yeah I think it's just different Uh, it's important to all of us doing it so it's it's not you know less or easier or harder for anyone probably Uh, but uh, yeah I think it's just a bit uh, the context matters Uh, and in that case uh, yeah for me it was you know a lot of extra evening and weekends and things like that uh, but it was good. What were the main things that you took away from your your time in in uni? 
I think uh, a lot of the aspects we looked into around maybe sports psychology, which I didn't touch before, mm. uh, were interesting to me. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think it's also a good time for certain things like um, for sports science to be more aware of data and data science and these towards getting closer together. So um, it was the first year, for example, that there was this course um, teaching data science uh, to sports scientists. And that's the course that I now have teaching. So it's, you know, opportunities that come from these processes, um, which I think are, again, timing is everything, right? You need you know, everything to fall in the right place at the right time. And this was, I think, a good opportunity because uh, everything is more mature, the field is more mature, and these kind of things are getting more integrated. Like 10 years ago, we were, you know, doing all sorts of things with these wearable sensors, but it was, you know, to write papers, like people could not use them. There were not, no sensors basically that you could use for this purpose. And then, you know, using the data and playing with the data, now you have, you know, master's degrees in data science and sports science and all of those things together and combined before there was data science was not even a term like 10 mm. years ago, you know, you would have, okay, machine learning and different, you know, um, it was actually my PhD is in electrical engineering. Like yeah. it was, you know, I wasn't playing with chips. I was playing with data, but still, you know, the university architecture is a bit old school. It takes time to change. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think now it's a good time to do these things. Mm -hmm. Without without obviously wanting to take a jab at uh, the universities or anything like that, what was in your, from your perspective, um, maybe the thing that they, could or should improve on the most in terms of their framework or how they teach things or uh, what they what they brought to the students was this something that stood out for you that was that seemed particularly outdated at the time? Uh, well, here um, I think it was pretty good. It was quite uh, like you have a strong practical side of things where you know you have to spend many months with a club or a team and do those kind of things, and then there is the more theoretical side of things where you have, you know, standard exams, studying and doing your exams. Um, a lot of activities in group, which I think is sort of helpful in, you know, getting to work with others. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it was a bit short, master's here one year, uh, mm -hmm. unless you want to do a PhD, then you do get an extra year. I think that's maybe too compressed if I have to criticize something. I think, uh, yeah, I think more time and more courses should be there to allow people, you know, to learn more things and have more impact than instead of just, you know, trying to, uh, yeah, come up with things when they get in, in the real world, as you say, uh, which, yeah, I think that's the term. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it a bit of a longer path, I think would be better, but I mean, universities are different. Maybe it is just the case here and also where it's still two years or more. Were you were you already deep into HRV at the time that you went back to, to uni? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it, has, it had already been uh, many years, uh, you know, the company, uh, well, the app itself, uh, it's maybe eight, nine years uh, since the first mm. versions, you know, that worked with external sensors and things like that. Um, so, yeah, this was at least five, six years later. Okay. It was just very recent. Yeah. So let's let's dive into HRV now. Uh, for people who don't know what it is, can you give? I'm, I'm sure you have a, a a nice little primer in in your head that you can uh, that you use, and you know, when, whenever you meet someone, they say, "Hey, what do you do?" And oh, what's HRV? Explain. So, what 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 is HRV, Marco? All right. So, HRV is a marker of physiological stress. So, it's basically a way that we can capture the body's response to stress, and in practice, um, that works in a way in which we look at the differences between consecutive heartbeats over a period of time. So say we collect data for a minute or a few minutes, and then we look at how heart rate changes on a bit-to-bit -bit basis over this time period. That's information that is basically associated to the level of physiological stress on the body. And that is due to basically the basic physiology of how heart, the heart rhythm works, which is, you know, you start from an intrinsic uh, firing rate um, in the heart, which is more or less 100 beats per minute. And that's fairly constant. 
means that that state, you know, there is no variability. Everybody is more or less the same. Uh, and, you know, as we all know, our heart is not beating at 100 beats per minute when you're resting, right? It's typically a lot lower. Hopefully that's not. Due to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, hopefully not. Uh, and that's due to the autonomic nervous system, which is uh, innervating the heart and is regulating um, heart rhythm. The autonomic nervous system uh, is basically the part of the nervous system which is regulating a million processes continuously so that everything stays more or less in balance, you know, from, again, heart rhythm to blood pressure. Um, yeah, anything you can think of that you don't have to consciously regulate mm. is basically taken care of by the autonomic nervous system. We have two branches. The one that is the most relevant for what we talk about in terms of resting physiology and heart rate variability is the parasympathetic one, just the one that is slowing things down. So the one that, you know, when you are recovered, is more active. And then we have the sympathetic one, which is normally the one that is more engaged when we exercise, for example. And, you know, there's been plenty of studies at this point, you know, with um, pharmacological methods showing that, you know, you can block one or the other so that you can see what's the effect on heart rhythm. And that's how we know that, uh, you know, the parasympathetic branch reduces heart rate and increases heart rate variability. Uh, and that's what we measure with, you know, the tools we develop and just a way to capture the activity of the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic branch in response to stress so that, you know, we can see, for example, when there is more stress, which means a lower heart rate variability uh, at rest. Can you talk a little bit more about, uh, before we, uh, I guess, deep a little bit diver into HRV, uh, the, the resting heart rate? Um, what are the major factors that influence the resting heart rate? You talked about the parasympathetic um, nervous system that's going to essentially put a break on uh, the, the intrinsic uh, rhythm of the heart. Um, and then obviously, when we go to higher intensity, sympathetic takes over and makes it go even faster. So the, the parasympathetic is a, is, a, is a factor, but what, what other things influence your resting heart rate? So if somebody, for example, has 65 or 70 resting heart rate, uh, what can they do to get that down to, to lower numbers? And how come, uh, if you maybe can comment on why we see such low resting heart rates, in, uh, especially in endurance athletes? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the basic mechanism is, let's say, the same across people, but then there are large differences uh, across individuals due to a number of factors. Uh, for example, if we look at um, things like cardiorespiratory fitness level, right? So as you say, fitter athletes tend to have a very low heart rate. Uh, people that are less fit uh, across the board will have um, a higher resting heart rate. That's something that, you know, um, I would say is quite a strong link between uh, the two parameters. You know, it's not as strong as heart rate during exercise, right? That's a much better, you know, some maximal marker of fitness, but at rest as well, we have, I think, a strong link uh, due to, you know, simply how we respond to exercise, right? The heart muscle changes, mm. uh, it can, you know, pump more blood, uh, which is, uh, which is a uh, bit, uh, and, you know, reduce also heart rate to deliver, you know, the same uh, cardiac output. So that's what we see. Uh, consistently, I think, across the board. Um, and it's also one of the easiest things to see in response to interventions, right? You get inactive people to exercise, um, their heart rate most likely will reduce a bit over the protocol. So that's a strong uh, differentiator between people. Other things are related also to, well, I would say any aspect of health, of course. Uh, you know, we can oversimplify and look at things like body mass index, you know, people that are let's say on the less optimal sides of the spectrum, you know, either underweight or overweight or obese tend to have, you know, much higher resting heart rates. Um, at the same time, we have uh, also sex differences. So women have a higher resting heart rate. Um, I think here's also where it gets interesting with HRV because the two are obviously linked, right? We know that higher resting heart rate typically is associated to lower HRV. But um, it's not always that simple when we look at the population level. For example, um, in the context of fitness, you know, HRV is, uh, you know, something people with a high HRV will maybe use it to brag about their high HRV, like if it is some marker of 
you know, outfit you are or anything like that. But the reality of things is that it's a very weak link with fitness. Uh, it's mostly genetic. So uh, it's really not something you can do. Uh, there's not much you can do about changing your, you know, baseline uh, HRV value. Maybe we can also talk more about that later. But just to say that it's easier to change your resting heart rate than your resting HRV with interventions like exercise. Um, and even, you know, we said women have slightly higher resting heart rate, but the HRV typically is very similar or there are no obvious larger differences in there between men and women. Uh, so, you know, there could be also reasons there to, to uh, hormones and, you know, other parameters that differ between men and women. Um, this is somewhat confirmed by the fact that after menopause, with, where, you know, there are less of these differences, um, the data looks more similar between men and women. So, you know, it could be that earlier you see more of that. Uh, yeah, I would say these are some of the more important parameters which um, we can link at the population level to changes in heart rate and HRV, even mm -hmm. though, uh, yeah, the most important thing to do always with this data, I think it's to look at your own, you know, and over time and changes in response to stress more than comparing with others. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come back to that point because it's a very important one and we'll, we'll dive pretty soon into what uh, HRV is good to look at for. Uh, are there some contexts where it's better to look at resting heart rate than HRV? So I think uh, for certain stressors, uh, you have a similar response, which means in both cases, it's very strong. Like there is a huge difference with respect to when you do not experience that stressor. That's something like, for example, getting sick, right? Your resting heart rate will be much higher and your HRV will be suppressed. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that if HRV is um, in general more sensitive to stress, you might experience similar suppression for other stresses, uh, while heart rate will not change as much, while it will still change that much for that strong stressor. So in a way, um, when you see a high heart rate, that maybe is a really a red flag because you know you need really a strong stressor to change heart rate that much. Mm -hmm. While if your life is more or less in balance and you're looking at more subtle stressors, for example, in the context of optimizing training, you know, in athletes that try to take care of everything from diet to sleep and all of that, then HIV becomes more sensitive to these little changes in stress and becomes more helpful. Um, so I would say, you know, looking at both, I think is always best because, you know, you have a bit of a change in HRV and your heart rate is perfectly normal. Maybe it's not time to worry yet, right? So because it's just maybe you picked up something that is not yet a big deal for your body. While if the change is in the heart rate is large, that's most likely uh, a very large stressor. You know, we see that also like with excessive alcohol intake, all the mm. typical things that, you know, are, let's say, rare events, not things that happen um, on a daily basis. Yeah, I, ideally not. Uh, what, what, yeah. what, what is considered a big a big jump in, in resting Harvey? What's the kind of standard deviation that you might see from, from day to day in a, in a given individual? And then when do, you, when do you start to raise some yellow or some red flags? Yeah, so when we look at uh, heart rate, we looked just recently for a paper we are putting together at the percentage change in mm -hmm. response to various stressors. So if we look in, um, at the response to training, often the change is less than 1%, so it's very mm -hmm. small. Um, and you know, if we look at data longitudinally, that typically is within one standard deviation. It's very difficult to see large changes in there. Mm -hmm. If we talk about sickness or alcohol, then we go much higher. We go four, six, eight percent. So that's definitely outside the typical one standard deviation that we use for this kind of interpretation. Mm -hmm. For HRV, the change is a bit uh, larger. So with training, we go between, I think, two, three, and five, four or five percent, depending on the intensity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a change that's already outside that um, typical standard deviation while again for alcohol sickness and so on we reach 10 12 percent so that's a very large change um and yeah i would say those are the typical ranges and, and changes we see 
similarly, I would say uh, for people that have a regular cycle, the menstrual cycle will have an impact there, mm -hmm. um, which it's a bit different because then, you know, basically it's there all the time in different phases. It's not just, you know, um, like these other stressors that you experience when you do something like training or, you know, when you're sick, which is a rare event. So I think that's something important to pay attention to because it might also confound your analysis if you don't think about it. For mm -hmm. example, you might, you know, you, we know that during the luteal phase, the second part of the cycle, we have a suppression um, in HRV, for example, and a slightly increased heart rate. So if you see those changes and you don't uh, factor in the fact that, you know, you're in that phase, you know, you might think that's a response to some other stressors while maybe that's just, you know, your baseline is just following that, that pattern. And then you look at changes with respect to that. So it becomes a bit different. I think those are the main factors to look at. Yeah, what you mentioned here, I think is really important is that, I guess that biofeedback aspect of, uh, looking at HRV and tracking it consistently, at least for me, and I've, I've been working with your app for, uh, I think, at least six weeks now, maybe maybe two months, cool. and um, really just paying attention to, okay, how do I feel? How does that look on the numbers? And, and, and making links between the two. Uh, for example, last night, I had uh, a pretty big meal, quite a bit of carbs. And I know that when I have a lot of carbs uh, late, not, not, it wasn't late, uh, but it was later at night, uh, I usually don't don't sleep very well and i definitely saw it on my i definitely didn't feel great this morning i felt all puffy my face was and i don't know if it was the amount of carbs that i ate or the mayonnaise that i ate with it which i hadn't eaten in a while which usually the oils i don't do great with so i probably have to dig a little bit into that but i mean even just the fact that it prompts those questions and forces me to ask myself oh what was it was it too many carbs? Was it too late? Was it the mayonnaise? <laughs> but but I think that that feedback aspect is really important because again, it it just maybe doesn't always give you the answers, but it forces you to ask better questions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's exactly the point. I think it should be about awareness and you know about giving some thought. It's not about uh, you know offloading the decision making process to some tool. I think the most important part is really the awareness bit. Trying to understand what is happening. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked to coaches that are like, yeah, we take the measurements, but we really like the questionnaire, like, because they want, you know, people just to stop a second and, you know, think about mm -hmm. the, how they feel, report back. Um, and, you know, that's, I think that's very important because otherwise, you know, we are always rushing to do something and we never stop and think about how we are feeling. Yeah, I, th I think the questionnaire, questionnaire is key and, and you've embedded that in the app after you, you take your measurement. You can't see the result of your measurement until you fill out the questionnaire, which again, I think is, is very clever because um, and I, I speaking to some of, of my athletes, I've, I've had a couple of them uh, get on the app and start using it. And they said, but I don't want to, I, I don't know how I feel in the morning. I don't, I don't want to think about that. I just want the number to tell me what's going on. And I said, well, no, we need, we need both, right? We need the physiological marker, but we need, we need your sensation as well. We need your perspective because what's going on between your two ears is just as important as what's going on actually uh, you know, inside, inside your body. And then, and then you get on the bike and now you have three points of, of, of data. And now we can actually make a, make a decision on, on something, but just looking at the data is not good enough. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's even not the right thing to look at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's, uh, people love to polarize the conversation, you know, just the numbers or just how you feel. And it's like, you know, you can use both. <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive. So, I think that's what's best. And as you say, context and training, then, you know, the other part of uh, the picture. So, you know, how that goes. Uh, and then I think when you start looking at all of them together, um, and I think it's really key to look at them like together, but separately, like not combined into, you know, some sort of um, scores that says everything, because that's how you actually basically dilute the insight you don't yeah. know anymore you know, uh, where does the um, reduction come from? Was the athlete not feeling good? Was the data not looking good? Uh, you know, what was it? What, was it the training? So I think it's not too much data. You know, we have few data streams here and there. You look at the subjective data, the objective markers of physiological stress, the training. And, you know, that's, I think is, uh, can be very helpful to get, you know, the full picture and then make hopefully some meaningful adjustments if needed. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to go into the practical side uh, pretty soon here, but before that, can we talk about the autonomics behind HRV a little bit more deeply? Uh, I was introduced by uh, to the con- concept of uh, the vagal break or the parasympathetic break through uh, the polyvagal theory, which absolutely blew my, it's by far the most complicated book I, I read. I, I definitely didn't understand half of it, but just trying to understand what he was saying, what uh, I think uh, Stephen or Stephen Porges uh, is the, the author of that book, uh, what he was talking about and really going deep into the, the autonomic nervous system. Um, so from your perspective, can you give a bit more details of how those, the parasympathetic sympathetic system uh, are interlinked and work together? I, I always thought before that, that it was like, like almost like a seesaw is like either parasympathetic or it's sympathetic, but actually from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm off, the sympathetic is kind of always there and it's the parasympathetic that comes and puts a break on it and it kind of dampens it down. Um, and so that's one of the things that we, that we measure with HRV, but uh, yeah, can you give us a bit more detail on, on that autonomic side? Yeah, I think, I think that's correct. So, um, um, well, the, you know, the theories are theories. So it's not something that, you know, in many cases we can even verify because we are unfortunately limits in what we can measure. So that's, uh, yeah, I would say one of the most challenging aspects uh, of all of this is that, for example, you cannot really measure the activity of the vagus nerve. So Mm -hmm. uh, you can only do like macro things, like we block the entire system, like we said before. So the Mm -hmm. parasympathetic system does not influence the heart. And then we know that, you know, for example, there is no variability there anymore. So um that's how we derive that then when it's there there is more variability Mm -hmm. then um an approach that we can take is um maybe a bit more data driven as well so we could experiment and induce stress uh, and then measure the change so then you know when we can do that and reproduce that i think that uh, is quite an effective way um, to understand how the system responds to various stressors And on the sympathetic and parasympathetic, yes, I agree that I think both of them are um, there at the same time. We know that also again from the uh, pharmacological studies when we are at rest, um, you know, the parasympathetic system is dominant, but it's not the only um, system that is modulating heart rate uh, because we do have a change also when the sympathetic system, for example, is inhibited completely then heart rate will further in change, change by something like another 10%. So even mm-hmm. when you're at rest, uh, you know, the huge change is due to parasympathetic activity, but there is uh, part of the sympathetic system, let's say, uh, having an impact there as well, even when mm-hmm. you're not doing anything. And even during exercise, I think, you know, we, we don't have such as, you know, binary switch between, okay, now the sympathetic is active and the parasympathetic is off. But um, yeah, it's more of a gradual process in which most of the time both are active. Um, and it's really difficult to measure both. Uh, as a matter of fact, with heart rate variability in the old days, there was this idea that um, by looking at the frequency spectrum, you could basically you know, look at um, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic because you know, we had divided these into bands and you had this um, frequency band, which is the one where breathing is which is the high frequency band and that's where uh, we associate basically that band to the parasympathetic system and then we had this low frequency band that was let's say associated to the sympathetic system but i think more and more studies have shown that that is not really the case when Mm -hmm. you look at this band you're again looking at both so you cannot really just say how much of one or the other you have, what is the balance, those kind of things we really don't know. Um, that's why I try to simplify and say, okay, the most of what we measure here is the parasympathetic system. And let's just look at that. Most of the time you will have reductions in that when there is more stress, then it will rebound back. And that's the information we can quantify reliably. And so I think it's more helpful to do that than to look at many different indexes and making, you know, many assumptions um, yeah, and not being really sure about what we are doing anymore. Yeah, yeah, I guess it, it makes sense to say, I guess, then that HRV is an integrated measure of 
the balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. We can't say which one is necessarily high or which one is low. We can just say what the summation of, of, of both uh, kind of display is that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of, I would say, but still with a strong parasympathetic component, okay. like yeah. the, the key is really, is really there that because mm -hmm. of how we measure it, um, yeah. you know, the, the feature we use the MSSD, which is very similar to the high frequency power, just um, basically it's just math to compute HRV, right? But the way it is done, it's gonna look at these high frequency changes. Um, and as such, it's more reflective of parasympathetic activity because parasympathetic activity acts very quickly. And, you know, in less than a second, you have a variation in heartbeat. That's why, uh, for example, during breathing, you know, when you exhale, the parasympathetic system modulates heart rate more. And that's why you see this um, very, let's say, uh, long RR intervals. So basically very low heart rate on a bit to bit basis when you exhale. And then this picks up again when you uh, inhale and heart rate goes higher and the distance um, basically goes smaller. And all of that um, is basically because the activity of the parasympathetic system is supposed to be pretty quick and, you know, to modulate heart rate at that um level and that's why it is captured by these features that we use like msd which looks at these bit to bit differences not mm -hmm. just that um overall features uh overall characteristics of the of the signal with respect to the average for example like other features um so yeah mathematically it's just uh more representative of the parasympathetic system that's why yes both are always active uh, at rest the parasympathetic is predominant, uh, let's say 90% of the changes due to that. Mm. Um, and that's what we look at and what we capture. Okay, that, ma that makes sense. I want to talk quickly, I don't want to go too deep into it, because I, I already did with Bruce Rogers. So for people who want to listen about or, or hear about HRV in the context of dynamic exercise, go check out that episode with Bruce. But uh, one thing that uh, I, I guess I guess I realized through what I learned through to you and through Bruce as well, uh, and again, I, I'd love you to maybe expand just a little bit from your perspective, is that if we take int intensity distribution, I know you're uh, an accomplished runner as well. Um, my understanding now is that uh, below your first threshold, you're going to maintain that parasympathetic dominance, which is one of the reasons why from a fatigue perspective, um, the, the 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 volume accumulated in the moderate intensity domain will be less impactful and maybe even have a positive impact on the status of the athlete whereas when you go beyond that threshold and obviously it's not a single point in in time or space or on a, on a data set it's it's more of a gradual like you said it's a transition and it's the same with thresholds um but beyond that beyond that band of intensity let's call it um now we're going to have more of a fatiguing effect on the system as a whole due to the fact that we transition to maybe a, a more parasympathetic status to a more sympathetic driven uh kind of intensity does does that make sense to you or is there something to, to correct there yeah no i agree i think uh, you know for quite some time people have tried to look at hrv also in the context of exercise it's always been a bit difficult because, uh, yeah, the parasympathetic system, or at least the way we measure it, is very suppressed, right, when we exercise. So then the change has always been very minimal and almost not possible to see changes unless you do maybe a maximal exercise test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not very applicable because, uh, you know, you don't do that very often or maybe ever, hopefully ever, <laughs> right? So uh, with the work that um, Bruce Rogers has done and, and the team uh, working with him, uh, they've been looking at other features that seem to capture uh, these changes in these intensity zones that you mentioned a bit better, mm -hmm. um, or at least to be, yeah, to allow for a wider range of HRV in mm -hmm. that context so that you can analyze it in a way that um, it is of more practical utility, I would say. So it's still a way to look at um, yeah, variability between bits, but more uh, in the context of how the properties of the signal, signal change with respect to themselves. So mm -hmm. some sort of autocorrelation over time. Um, yeah, and that's maybe something that even at rest would be 
uh, indicative of you know the similar processes that we measure also with other features. Um, we haven't looked into that yet, also because it takes a bit longer, uh, even just two minutes. And you know most of the data we collect is just one minute, so those kind of things you know you need then to uh, standardize and, and analyze correctly. But at the same time, I think uh, yeah maybe that's something to look into to see if we can capture, for example, similar responses to stressors also with respect to the typical features we use. I think it's an um, interesting uh, area to, to further explore. Mm -hmm. If we talk now about technology and what tech we're going to use to measure HRV, uh, can you give us the Coles notes on currently 2021, end of 2021, going into 2022, what's available to uh, the everyday end consumer and what are the, the, the best choices at this point to, to get a uh, an accurate measurement of, of HRV and maybe you can go into the details of why getting an accurate measurement is important especially with HRV whereas uh, heart rate is is a little bit different on that on that scale yeah yeah for sure so I think uh, you know we have three things to consider one is um, measuring accurately right but the second thing which is very linked to the first one is to have a protocol for that measurement like there are devices that are very accurate to measure HRV, but then they give you data that is actually of no use. And later we can have some examples um, of, of the issue, but that is very important. It's not something that, you know, you wear something and it spits some numbers. It does not mean that you can get an understanding of what's physiological stress um, done that way, because context is key when you measure and you can talk about that a bit. And the third one is also how you interpret that data. like. Okay, you measure with an accurate device, you measure according to you know, best practices at the right time, uh, where you have this data, and then still you need to be able to understand what's uh, you know, a change that is significant outside of what is normal for you and what is just day-to-day -day variability, because there are high, let's say there is high day-to-day -day variability, there are large changes from a day to another, and you don't want to read too much into that. Like you don't want to read into noise. You want to read into, you know, meaningful changes. So these three steps, I think, are hardly accomplished very well by any device. But the first two, uh, we made huge progress, I think, in the past five, six years. Mm -hmm. The sensors that are collect data accurately and that also build a sort of a either a protocol or collect data in a way that is meaningful, even automatically. Um, that has changed a lot recently. So I think uh, we can start there. So, you know, before we had uh, nothing but chest straps and some apps that you could use to measure uh, HRV. Then with HRV for training, we introduced, uh, you know, the measurement with the camera. And you know, validated that with respect to ECG and chest straps. So that's obviously an alternative that you have today. That means that you know you don't need any sensor. Like you place your finger on the phone camera and measure for one minute, and that as as good as any other um, device out there. So what, was that, that was that your idea? Yeah, yeah, that's something we developed uh, with HRV for training. So uh, well, how yeah, did you probably, how did you think of it? Did, was this another app that was doing something? similar so or other apps had, using the, the exactly the... so there were apps uh doing heart rate for that mm, you know okay. so with the camera so we, there was this mit project that started doing heart rate with the camera uh and in the same period i was working with these wearables to do you know uh, again hrv and those sort of things but you know they were wearables that had uh you know traditional electrodes like hospital ecgs almost mm -hmm. but wireless so it was first steps towards wearables um, and then I was familiar with HRV and then, you know, I had a background in computer science engineering and coding. And then this, uh, it was the days of, you know, maybe the iPhone 4, the first iPhones that could also link to sensors. Mm -hmm. So again, timing was good. The, we had the first uh, apps trying to do heart rate with the camera. And then I started from there, but then went to into HRV. And uh, yeah, the camera of the phone was good enough. Uh, then later, you know, there had been more research on this and the reason for the camera, despite being, you know, relatively low frequency uh, in terms of the signal acquired, because, you know, ECGs, we always say, okay, you need a thousand Hertz, you know, or 500, so high frequency data. And the camera, you know, you can get it at 30 Hertz, right? So how can you get the same accuracy? 
The thing is that the shape of the signal is very different. You know, an ECG has a very sharp peak. It is the where the basically the R peak is. This is what you measure. Mm -hmm. So that you need to time it like very precisely. Otherwise, you're going to be off by and you cannot computationally correct it. While the PPG, the signal, you know, basically blood flow that you measure with all optical sensors these days, the camera or other things, um, that is just a smooth wave. So the way you identify the peaks is very different. Uh, and at that point, basically you can do it even with much lower frequencies. And indeed, um, yeah, you don't have to take my word at this point because there have been like many validations of this showing that um, compared to ECGs and chest traps, when you compute both the RR intervals and the features like RMSSD, then mm -hmm. eventually you get the same numbers. So I think that that was for us, uh, yeah, the main driver of the innovation and everything that we've been doing because uh, it allowed people to measure just with a phone. Uh, you know, many more people got interested into this kind of things because it's a lot more practical and easier to do in the morning. Uh, you know, you don't want to wear a strap typically, you know, first thing in the morning. Uh, and then, you know, that's, uh, yeah, quite helpful if you want to do it, um, yeah, just with the phone, it's, it's pretty easy. Then on top of that, we started having like more wearables that can do things in the night, right? So that's mm -hmm. another advantage for many people because, uh, you know, for me, it's no trouble measuring one minute in the morning, but, you know, there's people that maybe have, I don't know, small kids or uh, things like that. Then make it difficult to, you know, have a stable routine in the morning or uh, the technology is pushed to someone. Let's say you're working a team and you mm -hmm. say, okay, all athletes use this technology now. And then it's not something that they decided to use. It's something they need to remember to use. And it can be more difficult. Like I've seen in, you know, in professional teams, sometimes everybody's compliant. Sometimes half of the team is compliant. Um, and then it's not very useful if you don't really do it at least three to five times per week. So uh, now we have, you know, the order ring. We have the boop. I think Fitbit also measures in the night. So there's like a few devices that do that. They all do it a bit differently. Um, I think my advice there, and I work also with Aura, so, you know, full disclosure, obviously, you know, I, th I know very well the tools where I work. I know mm -hmm. sort of the, the other tools because I know what is known in, you know, based on what they document. Um, but, uh, and another important thing here is that these are products. So tomorrow they could change, right? It's right. not something that is written Fixed in stone. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, you know, we say we don't like something and then the algorithm can change tomorrow. So maybe they will change positively, you know, towards something more accurate. Hopefully. But what I want to say, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like what, what I can say to users is simply uh, try to provide some guidelines or, you know, evaluation points so that no matter the device uh, or, you know, the future device that will be here, um, they can understand why one method might be more reliable than another. So then you, know, you can use that critical thinking applied to any device. Mm -hmm. So I the think thing that's, is- That's that, a good thing to yeah. go into, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the best we can do because there is always new sensors, right? So for morning measurements, that's easy, right? You use the phone camera in our app or you use a chest strap, Polar, Garmin, both are good. Um, or you use another app, if you like another app, with a chest strap and that's fine. You measure in the morning um, and you get your accurate snapshot of resting physiology. You do that before doing anything else, before you take your coffee, before you exercise. It's very important that you are at rest. You can do that for just a minute. If you prefer to measure a bit longer, two or three minutes, totally fine. You don't need to stay there five minutes like in the old days for these features. Um, frequency domain analysis requires time. Mm -hmm. But for these time domain features like RMSSD, you can do it in just a minute. It's equivalent, also plenty of research showing that. So that is fine. I think that's easy. Uh, if you use a device that measures in the night, I think there uh, it's important to understand how the data is sampled. Uh, for example, um, devices like the Apple Watch, which is capturing some random data points as you sleep. Normally, maybe it gives you two, three data points tend to be very noisy. It's very noisy for different reasons. One is that um, there is an effect of the circadian rhythm on your resting physiology, right? So as you go to sleep, your heart rate normally gradually reduces a bit 
over the night and your HRV will increase a bit. So if you were to take a data point, uh, you know, once at 2 a.m. and once at 4 a.m., then the impact of the circadian rhythm would mess up the data. So it's not anymore the same context because it's a different time. Mm -hmm. Now, this would be a small problem, let's say, uh, these changes are not so large and maybe the device can always measure at 4 a.m. every day, right? So it could be consistent. The larger issue there is that when you sleep, the influence of sleep stages on HRV is enormous. So, you know, people think I'm unconscious. That's for sure the best time. I cannot mess up the measurement by thinking about work and things like that. But while you are unconscious, like your nervous system can be wild. Like during REM sleep, there is huge activity. It's like, it's worse than when you're awake, right? So you cannot, if you take a data point and it was sampled during REM sleep, that data is basically no use if that's the only data point you have. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a good representation of your baseline physiology. Mm -hmm. And then others will say, yeah, but we use only deep sleep. But then what is our ability to detect deep sleep? The truth is that we cannot do that. Yeah, you need so, you need more you need more than just a watch to do that. My my wife had a, yeah. a sleep a sleep test. Uh, she undergone she underwent a sleep test. Uh, it was now a year and a half ago, and she sent me a picture of her body and face when she was all wired up for the night. And it was it was not just a watch on the wrist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm sure it's very representative of your typical night of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, she did. She had, I, I'm totally with you there on the go into a, a foreign place and be wired up completely to the point where you're a little bit stressed out, maybe, and it's hard to sleep and then measure and use that as a as a data point. She did. She did have to wear a a, a watch, a, a specific watch for I think it was 15 or 30 days before that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, studying sleep is very, it's very hard. You know, the reference <laughs> system is messy, and then we collect data in such, you know, unrealistic situations. Uh, it's difficult. Yeah. But then, you know, that's also the reference we have. Like mm -hmm. when we build algorithms, that's the PSG, right? It measures activity of the brain, activity of the eye, activity of the muscles. And then, as a matter of fact, the way we define the truth, like if you are in deep sleep, you know, typically it's a person that is looking at this data, but is scoring it, right? You say, okay, here it's deep sleep and here it's REM sleep. And then another person does that. And then they agree maybe 80, 85% of the time. So that's the reference we have is also inaccurate. Mm. And then on top of that, we develop algorithms that use the autonomic nervous system activity. So a proxy to, you know, the activity of the brain in this mm -hmm. case. Um, to try to detect stages. And all the wearables out there right now get that right 60, 65% of the time. So it's very low. And we did some decent work recently where we get maybe close to 80%. So that's a lot better, but still that might allow you to say, okay, more or less I slept this amount of time in deep sleep and over time to see some trends, but it will never allow you to say, this was the last five minute segment of deep sleep in my night. Mm -hmm. Like that is absolutely impossible because we don't have that accuracy. Like no system has. And even if you measure, you know, with brain waves, because again, it's a person's opinion against another person's opinion. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's just a messy application. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you know, all of this sounds very complex, but the, what is the bottom line here? Like my point is that Actually, you can go the easiest possible way. So you measure throughout the night and instant, instead of trying to be like super clever about looking at this or that, you just use the entire night of data. Because mm -hmm. if you take the entire night and you average it out, then the effect of these changes in sleep stages will be averaged out. Mm -hmm. The circadian rhythm will be you know, the same across days. And that snapshot, which is you know, anything between four, five and eight hours, if you use the full night or just, you know, the first four or five hours, um, like some tools do, I think that's great. It's, you yeah, know, a good okay. assessment of resting physiology. And so if you look for a tool, just check with the company, is it measuring, you know, 
four hours, five hours, the full night, then great. That you can use that as an assessment of resting physiology, the mm -hmm. same way you would use a morning measurement. If you get very sporadic data points, you know, just one five minute segment or a couple of randomly collected data points, um, then I would say that's a no-go. It's going to be very noisy. It's going to be very difficult to derive anything, uh, to, especially to assess more subtle stressors. Again, when we look at HRV, mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure you capture things like you are sick. The ones we said before, right? Sick or high alcohol intake. You know, those are examples you say also online. Like you see it all the time with all the tools. It's like, okay, but is that why you bought it? I mean, right? I'm, I'm sure that there is more on the day-to-day -day and the management of things and stress that we want to really look at these more subtle things more than this enormous stresses that you don't need the technology for. Yeah, hope, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we talk now about interpreting that data, and by the way, I've, I've definitely noticed that, um, yeah, alcohol intake, I'm about eight to 10 beats higher at, at rest. And my, my resting heart rate in the morning now is about I'd say average is probably 51 to 54 is, is kind of the range. And I, I, I'm the days that I have drank in the last two months, I've been, I've been like close to 60 or over 60. Uh, and it's quite, and you can even feel it. So you're like, you, you wake up in the morning and if you pay attention, uh, that's an, again, going back to the biofeedback uh, piece is that it forces you to, to think and to look within a little bit and, and be like, okay, so, oh yeah, that's, Okay, that's what's going on in there. It's it's really it really disrupted the 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 whole system quite significantly. It's I guess it it should be evident to us how bad it is for us given how we feel, <laughs> right? Yeah, but, for sure. But we just keep doing it over and over and over <laughs> again, and then um, yeah, it, maybe before we go into interpreting the data, can you talk about the impact of such a stressor as alcohol? Uh, one or two, maybe let's go for two nights a week because one, uh, maybe you could talk on both, but one or two nights a week of, of heavy drinking like I might have done in my, my young years when I was playing rugby uh, because this, that's just what we do. Um, what is the actual impact of, you know, a couple nights of heavy drinking during, during the week on, uh, on your physiology as a, as a whole and your, capa and, and yeah. your ability to recover? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it, it's difficult to um, generalize because, you know, it's going to be super individual um, and the amounts will matter, right? Uh, you know, when I hear, you know, even Matt, you know, Matt Walker is a sleep expert, uh, professor yes, yeah, at yeah. Berkeley. When, you know, when he talks about alcohol and caffeine, he's uh, often saying that, you know, in the studies they do, they see that even small amounts will have an impact on, you know, your body's ability to basically restore, right? Mm -hmm. And recover. So there might be things that you can see better in that kind of analysis with respect to resting physiology for small amounts of things. For higher amounts, like, you know, if you say heavy drinking twice per week, I'm sure, you know, that's a large impact on, you know, your autonomic nervous system. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. I, I, it's never too late to change. <laughs> I was I was young and I had all the all the right hormones in the right places. So I, yeah, exactly. I'm sure that's how I got through it. If I, if I tried to do even remotely close to this today, I would I would die. I would probably I would die. Uh, I feel like you're in a good shape these days. So probably <laughs> the habits have changed. <laughs> they've they've definitely changed substantially. Um, let, let's talk about interpreting the data. Uh, one thing that I really appreciated about your app when I started using it is that it doesn't tell you anything for a little while, right? You, you have to, because like you said, uh, like you alluded to it earlier in the, in the, in the, in the podcast, um, you don't want to look at one data point and you certainly don't want to look at your data point compared to another person's data point. You want to look at your own data set. And, um, and so I think it's, what is it? 14 days before, or is it six or 14 days before the, the app actually starts telling you things? So we, um... We provide some um, some information already after four days, okay. and then this builds up up to two months, and right. then that will get incrementally better up to mm -hmm. two months, mm -hmm. and then that point it will always be the last two months that will carry. Yeah. Uh, so that that's always current information. I think mm -hmm. you know you touched a great point there. Of course, uh, this kind of data 
it's uh, very individual, even more than, you know, we said before, like even more than other parameters like resting heart rate, right? You measure resting heart rate and yeah, maybe you can compare that with your runner friend if you do the same things and, you know, are of the same sex and of similar age and things like that. But your HRV, like there's absolutely no point comparing that. Like it might tell you that there is, well, if you and your friend are very different age, then there might be a difference that's linked to something. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the difference is most likely associated to, uh, yeah, nothing you can do <laughs> basically to change it. Yeah. It's just, you know, very strong genetic component. That's why I always say, you know, do not use it as something um, that you, basically as an outcome, right? Uh, do not try to do things to get your HIV to a certain state or level, but use it, you know, as part of the process to make adjustments so that what is the outcome is, you know, better health, better performance, because you manage stress better thanks to this, regardless of how it trends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously if there are huge lifestyle issues, again, like heavily drinking daily or, you know, having a terrible diet or, never having exercised. Yeah, for sure you can change your HIV as well by shifting that. But for healthy people, uh, yeah, there might be no change and it's totally fine. You use it in a different way. Use it as feedback for stress. Mm. And to do that, you need you know, to understand what is your normal and when you are outside of that. And that requires some data. Uh, you know, obviously HRV for training and other tools are also consumer products. So, you know, we cannot wait two months like we would do in a study. We need to give people something. And I think the bare minimum is, you know, about four days so that you have a bit of variability and then you start capturing, you know, when you deviate from that. But then again, this keeps increasing for up to two months. Uh, why two months? Um, I think there um, different trade-offs. It's not a magic number. You could use one month like in, they do in some studies. Mm. Um, I think in that case, in studies often they have some more constraints. You know, it's difficult to get the participants to, you know, do this every day before even starting the study. Mm. And then you have the study, like many complexities. But again, in real life, it's also different from a study. Um, I think you can use more time Anything between 40, 45 days and two months, I think is good because that way you don't get stuck in very old data because there is also seasonal components and those yep. other things. So your physiology four months ago, you know, it's not something that should drive the advice today. At the same time, you don't want to be super reactive. Like if uh, you have experienced just now, last week or two weeks ago, some period of poor health or something was wrong for several days, you know, you're daily scores were very low, your baseline reduced a lot. You don't want that to be your normal. And then, you know, everything now to be compared to that. So you want to have, you know, a broader range of values so that you capture these changes, potential reductions, bouncing back from that um, and putting things in context. So eventually we went for these two months. Uh, I know others use something more 40, 45 days. I think that's also all good. So now we have the data, we have ideally, uh, like you said, a couple months of, of data that we've accumulated. Uh, now, what should we do with it? What, what do we <laughs> let the data tell us or what do we try to extract from it? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to use the data, once you have you know, at least a couple of weeks of data and you see these day-to-day -day changes and you know, when you're outside your normal range and things like that, is to simply in training, try to basically reduce the intensity stimulus when you have um, periods below your normal range. So training is fine. And again, the athlete will be different, right? So the, if you work with a professional athlete and they train every day and twice per day, a low score does not mean that they cannot train, right? So maybe you don't need a day off. But if you work with someone that just picked up exercise and they are exercising maybe two, three times per week, then you know maybe a day in which the score is low is a day off, right? So the exact intervention will depend on the fitness of the athlete and you know their level and all of that. But the type of intervention, let's say what you do eventually, um, it's typically very similar in all of these recent studies. What they do is just to scale down the intensity because that's 
the problem basically the intensity is the problem more than movement right you can exercise at very low intensity and that's typically good even if your result is not great um, you know i'm a recreational runner myself i don't have any performance ambitions but i love my time outside and you know if my score is low i will go out and you know i can go out even for hours as long as i keep my intensity very low it's totally fine is there Things bounce back can yep. there even be a positive impact of doing something at lower intensity have you ever uh looked at when you have maybe a low hrv score or your trend is, is is going down and so in that case you would probably not go for as high an intensity as you uh, maybe might have had to do as per your planned training um is it better to take a rest day is it better to take to do some low intensity work is there one or the other that's better that can help you bounce back a little bit faster and better yeah, I think it's a great question. I don't think I've seen like data looking at this systematically. Like, I think that would be something really interesting to look into, you know, given the data that uh, has been collected by these tools or in a study so that, you know, you can maybe try to quantify the change in the autonomic response um, mm -hmm. in that case. We've seen for sure that when looking at the um, uh, response to training of different intensities, including the rest. So, no training, uh, we have a larger change, positive change after rest. But that is um, from an observational study point of view, it's not a training prescription. So that means that um, we can see that, but maybe that's just because the rest day comes after a very hard day in the normal routine of people. It's not something that was planned in a way that you would see the difference between rest and easy training. Mm -hmm. It's just something that you know you capture in the data because it might just be linked to the behavior of the athlete. So we don't have an answer to that. Um, but I think you know very individual as always. But we, what we can say is that there doesn't seem to be a detrimental effect of low intensity training most of the time. Uh, if it's just training causing the stress, obviously if you're sick or something, mm -hmm. then you know it's a different story. I think there are also studies looking at HIV acutely post-exercise, right? Yeah. Um, and there uh, you can see, for example, very well the effect of the intensity on HRV and different protocols on HRV, how HRV bounce, is bouncing back much quicker if there is no intensity, lower intensity. Um, and you know, those post exercise pre-post-exercise studies, I think, are best for this kind of analysis because you isolate everything else, you know, you just look at the stressor while when we look in the morning after that is more relevant in daily life because all stressors are captured but then it's more difficult to say if there is a suppression was it you know your dinner yesterday or was it your training right mm -hmm. very very good one who should use hrv everyone <laughs> i think <laughs> you know everybody's experiencing stress so it's either you know if you're an elite athlete most likely uh, you train a lot. So it can help you in that context. If you are a regular person like me, um, you know, there is work, family, or sort of other, you know, things that stress you out. And then it can help you keep things a bit in balance. For both, it can help from a health point of view because, you know, you got any issue with sickness and things like that will show up in the data. Um, who shouldn't use the data maybe is the person that is not able to disconnect a bit from it. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I was joking before, but obviously technology is not for everyone and data is not for everyone and it's totally fine. Um, looking at the data can be very insightful as long as you maintain a healthy relationship with it. Like if you cannot do that, um, then it's, it's problematic and sometimes it's just better to not use it and, you know, just, uh, rely on how you feel and things like that which is very informative as well but then I you think, have to listen to yourself as well <laughs> yeah exactly so you know that's hard depends. for some people as well <laughs> yeah exactly i think you know if you manage to do both and don't get too cocked up into it um and you know don't obsess over it and low score and you can still enjoy your day and things like that then uh, i think it can be helpful over the long term mm -hmm. Through, through all your research on the topic, uh, has there been any newly discovered influences on HRV that you didn't you hadn't thought of before or that uh, maybe maybe came up without expecting it? Or would you say that 
for the last few years, we've had a really good understanding of what influences HIV and what, what, what the main factors are. I think we are learning more um, thanks to the technology we have because the biggest limitation of, uh, well, one of the many limitations of um, research on HIV in the past 50 years, apart from you know using all sorts of features and all sorts of random devices and protocols, was that data was not collected continuously. So mm. you would have a measurement and then things happen for three months and then you have another measurement. And you know what are we looking at there? Like this means nothing. <laughs> like, unless there is really some enormous effect, like what are we looking at? So mm. I think that's the main challenge. And that is being resolved now. We can measure every day. We can, you know, answer a lot more questions. Even just these relationships with the menstrual cycle is something, you know, of the last decade, of the last mm -hmm. five years. Before there were studies, but you know, some of them showed the same relationship. Other something totally different because again, one data point over, you know, a period of weeks could be all over the place if you don't, you know, uh, look at data consistently daily. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, as now we have also all these tools that measure in the night and requires even less effort, I think we can really look at pretty much anything uh, in, you know, over the course of years of life. And, you know, even uh, I remember quite a few studies at the beginning of, of the pandemic showing changes in resting physiology mm -hmm. uh, due to people changing also their behavior associated to sleep and because, you know, you didn't have to go to work and things like that. And now we are looking at, um, we are seeing, for example, changes in resting physiology post-infection, right? Mm -hmm. So how long does it take for your resting heart rate to go back to the values you had before? And, you know, we are seeing, you know, a month after it's still elevated, right? Things like that. So that is possible only thanks to, you know, passively collecting data daily is not something you can design in a study. Um, you know, not very ethical to get people infected and monitor them afterwards. So um, I think there's a lot that we are learning now uh, on many different aspects, just because uh, the technology got so much more pervasive and easier to use um, and compliance is higher. So hopefully, you know, there will be more and more interesting research in the upcoming years. Outside of all the, um, the caveats that you, you, you mentioned when it comes to you know, the setting, the measurement, the tools, are there some uh, downsides to HRV in the sense of, uh, are there some uh, fatigue parameters on the physiological side that are not reflected uh, in HRV as a measurement? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, the biggest one is anything associated to muscular fatigue, right? Mm. So that is key to most sports, uh, if not all, right? Uh, also as a runner, I, you know, my main limitation, like most runners probably given the type of sport is that, you know, your muscles are gonna be sore. Uh, so that's, you know, something that uh, you cannot capture really with HRV. Um, I think it gives you, let's say something to work with in the context of if the data is not looking good, then you are at higher risk of issues happening because, you know, your immune function is suppressed and, you know, your recovery is impaired and, you know, all of that basically increases the risk of uh, injury and those sorts of things also in the context of exercise. Mm. So it helps you um, guiding things, but it cannot quantify certain aspects. That's why we always say, you know, start with a plan. That's the first thing. You don't start with HRE. You don't go hard every day until HRV is not good anymore, right? That's nonsense and the recipe for disaster, right? Start with a good plan, you know, you have your high intensity days, you have your low intensity days, and then you make some adjustments based on HRV. So it should be really something, you know, to check um, just for confirmation that things are going well, you know, hopefully you just see that normal range and positive trends it could flag that things are not going well, um, or it could help you make small adjustments, but always you know, on top of a training plan and knowing what you're doing in the first place. Yeah, I think the pl plan first is a, good, uh, is a good piece of advice for everybody listening. Um, what studies would you like to see conducted uh, around HRV in the coming years? So I would like to see a bit more on... Um, how we can potentially influence things. Like we made all this progress in measuring, 
Uh, and now, for example, there is more work on uh, breathing techniques, for example. And you see that this impacts acutely HRV, right? As mm -hmm. you do it, super high. But then one minute after, just like before. So is that changing something or not? And, you know, we have developed a tool also to practice these kind of things. And we've seen that people that, uh, for example, have very low HRV or lower HRV uh, do see a change over time during the session also. While, for example, if you had already a higher HRV, the values remain more or less constant even during the breathing session. So, you know, all these kind of aspects related to what can, what can you do and how can you influence your physiology in a way that maybe you can actually change it a bit over time. I think are interesting and uh, something that, you know, it's going to be more and more um, researched and investigated just because measuring the effect of that on resting physiology now is obvious. Everybody's measuring their resting physiology, while before even that stuff was very difficult to, to obtain. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, a, as a closing question, Marco, uh, what, what are you currently either passionate or fascinated about around HRV? Is there a specific aspect that you're digging into right now? I know you're, you're always coming up with, with great uh, tweets and, and threads on, on different topics around HRV. So I know you always have your head in, in, a, in a data set somewhere. So what, what are you currently looking into right now? So right now we just, um, I brought just a paper with Daniel Plews, who you might know is also one of the main scientists uh, working on these aspects, uh, looking at acute stressors as well as population changes. So all the things we discussed today, mm -hmm. but on a large um, set of people so that we can see, for example, a bit better, um, can you use HRV you know, when you're in your 20s? and in your 60s or 50s uh, in the same way in response mm -hmm. to training? Or mm -hmm. is that different because we know that HRV changes with age? Or, you know, or if you're a man or a woman or, uh, you know, all sort of different responses in different subgroups, uh, which, you know, we could not do before because you need a lot of data. And most importantly, you need that to be collected longitudinally over a long period of time. So, you know, in this data set, there's 30,000 people and each one of them has at least one year of data. So that is a lot of data in which you can also analyze, you know, the same stressor over time again and again and again. Because I think that's what's important when you look at these stressors, you know, we said before, okay, was it your dinner or was it your training? Mm -hmm. But then if we look at training uh, today, but then we do that again and again and again for a year at different intensities, then we can read through that noise and we can isolate one single stressor and do the same for our core and for um, sickness and for the menstrual cycle. So the longitudinal nature of the data that we discussed, I think that is key to isolate also acute stressors that would otherwise be difficult to capture or isolate in you know daily life in which all sorts of stressors happen daily. Mm. Well, that's really all fascinating. And uh, thanks for digging into all the numbers for, for all of us to extract something valuable. Marco, for, for people who want to follow your work, where can we uh, find out more about you? So I have a website, which is smartalteam.com or hrvfortraining.com for the app and everything we do there. Uh, and yeah, as you learned, I try to be quite active on Twitter. So there at Altini underscore Marco, um, you can find me there. And yeah, I'll try to keep sharing useful things. Yeah, it's good for, for everybody listening or watching. Check out the description for all the links. Uh, definitely check out the the app. It's worth, uh, I think I paid 10 francs for it here in Switzerland. It's about $10. Is that is that about right? Yes, that is a one-time fee that is about $10, yep. 10 euro more or less. Yeah, exactly. And I've been using it consistently. And it's definitely a, a very, very interesting uh, tool to use, feedback tool. And again, if you want to, if you have a solid plan and you want to, uh, make some minute adjustments based on how your your body's actually doing day to day. I think it's a it's a great thing it's a great thing to explore. Marco, thanks again for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, please take a few moments to leave a written review and a five star rating on Apple Podcasts. If you want to watch this episode again, you can find the full video recording on my YouTube channel. You'll also find hundreds of hours of free content, all my podcasts, my thoughts of the day, structured presentations, and more. So don't wait, go subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.